welcome to Mindscapes, our series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today is one of India's preeminent sociologists. His work is distinguished by his commitment to comparative sociology and an emphasis on the field view as opposed to a book view. He has refused to accept a privileged conception of society. He has lectured at universities around the world, at Cambridge, at the London School of Economics. He was one of the founders of the sociology department at the University of Delhi. He writes extensively in the popular media, making accessible complex sociological ideas to a larger community. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Andre Bethe. Welcome, Professor Bethe. Thank you very much. What do you see as the role of a sociologist? Uh, you have written extensively to suggest that uh, it is not a sociologist's function to uh, re-engineer society, uh, but in a sense to hold up a mirror to society. I, I really think that uh, you know, the idea of sociology as a policy science is not very promising. I mean, people have tried it out. I think in the earlier years of independence, uh, there was a great deal of enthusiasm for shaping our rural communities, for instance, by having expert opinion from sociologists. I won't say that they have no role to play at all in the making of policy, but that doesn't really interest me very much. What interests me, and what has always interested me uh, as a teacher, is uh, uh, clarifying issues, uh, helping people to understand a little better uh, the nature of the circumstances under which they live, the choices that are available to them, mm -hmm. and, 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 and to try to reason with them that, uh, that all choices are not available to human beings at any particular turn of events. Because I believe that ultimately, ultimately societies change through the actions of the members of those societies themselves. And therefore, if they are better informed, mm -hmm. then they will be better equipped mm -hmm. for changing that society. And I think that the sociologist has a role to play mm -hmm. in revealing mm -hmm. to them, holding up a mirror, as you put it, mm -hmm. before them, as to what is possible under these circumstances mm -hmm. and what uh, is unrealistic. You've also held that sort of, uh, uh, you know, the lessons of history uh, as it were, uh, we, we need to recognize and, and, and learn not just from, from its successes, uh, yes. but also from the possibilities yes. of, of failure yes. uh, that it holds out. Yes, yes, yes. yes I think so. I, 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 th I remember writing something of that kind. Uh, probably at that point of time, what I had in mind was the, uh, was the Soviet experience. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, I was an undergraduate in Calcutta in the mm -hmm. 50s. Mm -hmm. And if you were an undergraduate in Calcutta in the 50s, then you struggled with the idea of Marxism. I was never a Marxist myself, but uh, most of my cleverest fellow students were, were Marxists and became left intellectuals in course of time. I was always fascinated. I never believed the stories about the little father, how compassionate Stalin was, and how everything that, you know, uh, Sidney Webb's famous comment, I have seen the future and it works. I, I, I was a skeptic. If you ask me to explain why mm -hmm. I didn't believe that, I might find it difficult to do so, but I never really did. Mm -hmm. But as, as it unraveled, uh, it became more and more clear that my instincts were right. Mm -hmm. My instincts were right. And I think that we mustn't, we mustn't forget about uh, the nature of the experiment in social engineering mm -hmm. that was tried out in the Soviet mm -hmm. Union, and, and tried out uh, initially at least Mm -hmm. with much good faith, and then it soured. And I think that we must, mm -hmm. we must keep all that in mind when we are, when we are mm -hmm. uh, sort of enthusiastic mm -hmm. about formulas mm -hmm. that will change everything and bring in the brave new world. With, with sort of, let's say, uh, the decline of the fascination uh, amongst uh, the intelligentsia with China, the Soviet Union, and Marxism, um, it's, it's been replaced in, in, in some ways by a, a new uh, fascination to, on the one hand, capitalism, uh, globalization, uh, and, 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 and what kind of risks uh, to you as a sociologist? What do you see that uh, doing uh, for and, and in India? I think that there are uh, quite serious risks mm -hmm. of misrepresenting mm -hmm. and misunderstanding our predicament. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that if one were to look at the Indian context, uh, I would say that in the 50s and 60s, mm -hmm. uh, there was a great deal of, of, of faith in the, in the state, what the state could do through intelligent, rational, economic planning, uh, and what socialism could achieve. 
and uh, certainly uh, the, the best of the intellectuals I worked with in the Delhi School mm -hmm. of Economics, mm -hmm. Kane Raj and mm -hmm. Shukumar Chakravarti, mm -hmm. Amartya Sen, mm -hmm. I think they all believed mm -hmm. that rational uh, mm -hmm. human action mm -hmm. could guide mm -hmm. the destinies of this society through, mm -hmm. through some kind of planning and social engineering. Today there is the possibility of swinging to the opposite extreme. Mm -hmm. And, and believing that the market mm -hmm. will provide all the answers to our, our problems. Uh, as a sociologist, mm -hmm. I've always felt mm -hmm. that the state is very important mm -hmm. and the market is also very important. Mm -hmm. But there are very many other things that are also important mm -hmm. and we shouldn't lose sight of those other things. Mm -hmm. And these are the institutions of society, mm -hmm. including, uh, including the kind of institution in which I have spent all my working life. Mm -hmm our universities, for instance, mm -hmm. our hospitals, our libraries, our laboratories, all these institutions, I don't think that the working of these institutions mm -hmm. can be guaranteed mm -hmm. either by having a very good state mm -hmm. or by letting it, mm -hmm. uh, uh, letting the market take hold of these mm -hmm. things. I think that we have to be much more careful mm -hmm. about nurturing these institutions, protecting their autonomy, mm -hmm. and seeing that they are able to function mm -hmm. in an effective mm -hmm. way. And I don't think that the market provides the answer mm -hmm. to all our problems. Mm -hmm. I don't think so at all. Mm -hmm. I think we'll make a very serious mistake mm -hmm. if we believe mm -hmm. that we can put the market mm -hmm. in our hearts mm -hmm. in the place mm -hmm. in which, uh, which, which was held by the state in, mm -hmm. in, in the first 10 years of Nehru's mm -hmm. uh, prime ministership. Mm -hmm. To what degree do you think that it is in fact uh, possible and that uh, India might be able to resist uh, these sort of this, this sweep of, uh, you know, for want of a better word, liberalization, globalization? Well, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a long-term optimist, mm -hmm. although I may be a short-term pessimist. I'm not, I'm not terribly happy with, uh, mm -hmm. with the way in which this enthusiasm for the market has taken mm -hmm. hold of the minds of the brightest of our young people. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I think that, I, I, think that uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't think that we should we should be too afraid mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of globalization. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, uh, you know, we, have, uh, we have traditions mm -hmm. uh, which go back very far in time. We have a very vibrant and a very resilient mm -hmm. culture mm -hmm. with all its difficulties and all its problems. Mm -hmm. I don't think that there is really any mm -hmm. serious risk mm -hmm. of our traditions and our culture mm -hmm. being swept away mm -hmm. by MTV or whatever it is mm -hmm. that people feel afraid of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I deplore much of this on aesthetic grounds, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, try to oppose it mm -hmm. through some kind of political action. I think that that will be counterproductive. Mm -hmm. Another sort of emerging, uh, shall we say, to keep using the same phrase, uh, a, a privileged community perhaps, uh, is, is, is the Hindutva Brigade. Yes. Uh, a sort of a feeling again, uh, in, 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 in a more affirmative way perhaps, uh, that this, this represents uh, a, a unique uh, model which is in some ways uh, superior to others. Uh, how do you feel and, and see that uh, unfolding? Uh, I, 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 I am somewhat disturbed by it. Uh, I'm, I'm always disturbed by arguments about the uniqueness of India. Mm -hmm. Let the rest of the world go its own way. Uh, we will go our way. I think that that's not a very sensible idea. And I don't think that's a very Indian idea at all. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think, you know, I mean, if you look at our history, uh, our, our recent history, our medieval and ancient history, mm -hmm. this is a society which more than any other society mm -hmm. has benefited by taking in mm -hmm. elements of culture from all over the world. You know, there was a very, very outstanding uh, Indian writer and anthropologist mm -hmm. called Iravati Karve. Mm -hmm. And Iravati Karve always made this point. And she was not only a great mm -hmm. anthropologist, she was also a Sanskritist, she was a Marathi writer. Mm -hmm. She always said that the great characteristic of Indian civilization mm -hmm. has been the principle of accretion. Mm -hmm. We take things from mm -hmm. outside and we use them in our way. Mm -hmm. And I think that we will continue to do that despite mm -hmm despite the proponents of Hindutva, mm -hmm. much of which comes out of, of, of uh, a sort of feeling of helplessness, mm -hmm. of being unable to cope with the modern world. Mm -hmm. And you see this, if I may say so, mm -hmm. this fear of the modern world, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. fear of globalization. You see this very strongly in some of the Islamic countries. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid Hindutva, mm -hmm. in many ways, takes mm -hmm. as its model mm -hmm. some of the worst features of mm -hmm. Islamic fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. Why do you think you, 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 you mentioned uh, a short while ago uh, the institutions 
Uh, you mentioned education, you mentioned healthcare. Uh, why do you think that these have not really sufficiently figured uh, on, the, on the national agenda? Why is it that during elections, uh, political parties don't make an issue uh, of what they're going to do with health care, what they're going to do with education, and what seem to us to be sort of fundamental services, almost fund <coughs> fundamental yeah. rights. Yeah. Uh, these remain issues in the, in the U.S. presidential elections, but they're not issues on our agendas. Yep. Yep. No, that's true. And not only are they, are they uh, not issues in our political agenda, uh, but uh, they seem to be receding from our political agenda, from the list of issues on our political agenda. Uh, if you go back to the 1950s, I think, I think uh, uh, the, the political leaders were much more concerned with this kind of thing. But what has happened, I mean, as I see it, is that uh, uh, the politics of mobilization uh, has overtaken all other forms of politics. And mobilization now on the basis of caste and community, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps, I mean, uh, this, this may sound as, 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 a, as, a, as a very non-committal statement, mm -hmm. but perhaps we needed to go through all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that one mustn't forget mm -hmm. that this is and has been for 2,000 years mm -hmm. the most hierarchical society in the world in which large sections of the population were marginalized, mm -hmm. stigmatized, and excluded mm -hmm. from whatever was worthwhile mm -hmm. in social life. Mm -hmm. So some spaces have to be found for them. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, we have a constitution mm -hmm. which uh, is, if I may use the phrase, the most democratic constitution in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, e equality provisions in mm -hmm. the Constitution of mm -hmm. India are stronger mm -hmm. than the equality provisions in the American, much stronger than the equality mm -hmm. provisions in the American Constitution. Mm -hmm. So we have a constitution which, is, which gives a, a, a very prominent place to equality and democracy. And yet we have a society mm -hmm. which is so profoundly hierarchical. Mm -hmm. And therefore, transforming, mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, this program is called Mindscapes, mm -hmm. but you know, transforming the mindset mm -hmm which has been permeated by the principle of hierarchy for mm -hmm. 2,000 years mm -hmm. into one mm -hmm. where equality has mm -hmm. more room for play mm -hmm. is really a difficult venture. Mm -hmm. and, but I think that we have taken the right steps mm -hmm. in moving forward mm -hmm. uh, by, it, by means of, 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 of democratic politics, mm -hmm. despite all the noise mm -hmm. and the turmoil of our mm -hmm. present mm -hmm. political system. What and where do you think these, uh, the catalysts for change um, might come from. Uh, does it come from uh, visionary leadership that, that, that crisis or possibility might uh, uh, throw up? Uh, does it come from holding up this mirror that you know, the, the function that the sociologists perform partly uh, to the elites? Where does this catalyst for change come from? We can't really, uh, we can't plan mm -hmm. for a visionary leader. Mm -hmm. Uh, if a visionary leader comes by, mm -hmm. and if he's of the benevolent and not the malevolent kind, mm -hmm. then future generations will be grateful, thankful to him. But in the meantime, mm -hmm. I think that uh, we should continue mm -hmm. with the work mm -hmm. of uh, educating mm -hmm. the next mm -hmm. generation. I, I place a very high value mm -hmm. on education mm -hmm. and on sustaining mm -hmm. our legal order. Mobilization is good, it's important, I think it's indispensable. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we are now at a stage where, mm -hmm. where it's, it's very paradoxical. Mm -hmm. Many people seem to feel that every problem must have a political solution. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, mm -hmm. they hate mm -hmm. the political solutions that are on offer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we, we have placed too much load on the political system. There are other institutions mm -hmm. which have to be nurtured with greater care. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that the educational system requires more attention than we have given to it. Mm -hmm. well, this issue of, uh, of, of inequality that, that you have mentioned and, and written so extensively about, um, when uh, VP Singh's government uh, looked at uh, using, in some ways, the political process, the political structures uh, to re-engineer uh, the inequities of caste. Uh, it was something that, that you opposed, uh, though you support affirmative action in, yeah. in other ways. Uh, why did you oppose this? Um, I think that uh, uh, it was, in many ways, a retrograde step. 
Uh, I think that uh, the idea that our problems can be solved mm -hmm. through a system of extensive quotas mm -hmm. is a mistake. Mm -hmm. And I was not the first to point out mm -hmm. that this is a mistake. Let me, let me put it like this. Mm -hmm. I think that what we need mm -hmm. and w what we don't give enough thought to mm -hmm. is the problem of building citizenship. Mm -hmm. I think uh, a system of quotas is antithetical mm -hmm. to the principle of citizenship. Mm -hmm. By the principle of citizenship, I mean a principle which recognizes mm -hmm. certain rights mm -hmm. and certain capabilities of the individual, irrespective of caste, mm -hmm. race, gender, and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. I was reading the uh, debates mm -hmm. in the Constituent Assembly, mm -hmm. and uh, Pandit Govind Ballav Pant mm -hmm. made a very stirring statement mm -hmm. saying that we must stop mm -hmm. thinking about castes and communities and think about the citizen mm -hmm. instead. And everybody cheered. Mm -hmm. um, you know that uh, after uh, independence, shortly after the new constitution was adopted, the government set up a commission, a backward classes commission, mm -hmm. um, uh, under Kaka Kalelkar mm -hmm. to recommend measures for the other backward classes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the recommendations of that commission mm -hmm were infructuous because Kaka Kalelkar, mm -hmm. although he didn't give a mm -hmm. note of dissent, mm -hmm. he wrote a long letter to the mm -hmm. president saying that his heart was not in it. Mm -hmm. And I think that he gave a very convincing explanation. Mm -hmm. He said that, uh, uh, I think that he said somewhere that nothing should be allowed to stand mm -hmm. between the individual, mm -hmm. the integrity, uh, the, the freedom of the individual and the integrity of the nation, mm -hmm. and I'm opposed to it. Mm -hmm. So I think that, mm -hmm. that my opposition mm -hmm. to uh, a comprehensive system of mm -hmm. quotas mm -hmm. is really mm -hmm. in the spirit mm -hmm. of the makers of the Constitution, mm -hmm. in the spirit of mm -hmm. Kaka Kalilkar. Mm -hmm. I'm not against affirmative action. In fact, I think that mm -hmm. some affirmative action mm -hmm. is, is extremely important. Mm -hmm. But I really don't believe mm -hmm. that we can run our present Constitution if we add 33% mm -hmm. quotas for women mm -hmm. in addition mm -hmm. to the quotas that we have for the scheduled castes, mm -hmm. the scheduled tribes, and the other backward classes. Mm -hmm. And there will be claims for mm -hmm. quotas within quotas, mm -hmm. as there have been, as you know. Mm -hmm. So we will reduce ourselves mm -hmm. to a checkerboard of quotas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody once told me, as a joke, mm -hmm. the, uh, the American political scientist Myron Wiener, he once told me that. He said, you know, we were talking about, and he knew about mm -hmm. my opposition to quotas, and uh -huh. he was not very friendly. And he uh -huh. said, you know, one of these days I'm thinking of standing up mm -hmm. and asking for a quota for left-handed Lithuanian Jews. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, you know, mm -hmm. the idea that India is different mm -hmm. and India can achieve constitutional democracy mm -hmm. through a system of mm -hmm. uh, comprehensive mm -hmm. quotas is, mm -hmm. I, I, I really... Mm -hmm. I really, I, my, my basic opposition to comprehensive quotas is that it is a threat to the structure of our constitution. In what ways do you feel that uh, uh, the initiatives that were taken at that time uh, have played themselves out, uh, particularly in the way that they have expressed themselves in the, in the access to power, uh, the pursuit of power and its, 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 and its expression? Yes. Uh, I think that uh, 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 it's easy enough now with the advantage of hindsight mm -hmm. to say that we did not pay enough attention to education, mm -hmm. to, 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 uh, to elementary education, mm -hmm. to primary health care. Mm -hmm. And if I may, if I may uh, m uh, use a distinction, mm -hmm. it's the distinction between uh, universality and equality. I think that we we were too caught up with equality. I'm, I'm not a great enthusiast for equality. Mm -hmm. And we did not pay sufficient attention to universality. Mm -hmm. And by universality, I mean simply the principle mm -hmm. which makes available certain basic mm -hmm. uh, facilities and certain basic capabilities mm -hmm. to all members of society, irrespective of race, caste, creed, mm -hmm. gender. But once you admit that, then you also recognize that what can be made universally available have to be a limited number of basic and fundamental things. And you should not allow your preoccupation mm -hmm. with uh, inequality in the distribution of income to interfere with this. I think we paid too much mm -hmm. attention mm -hmm. to the eradication of inequality. I don't believe that we can eradicate inequality, and I don't believe that we need 
-hmm. to eradicate inequality. But we do need to secure universality in the sense in which mm -hmm. I put, mm -hmm. put that. And I don't think that this was perceived quite as clearly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the first decades mm -hmm. after independence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what about, how, how would this, how would the, the, the people, uh, let's say, less privileged in, in, the, in the scale of uh, equality, uh, less equal, yes. uh, be able to uh, access uh, political power, be able to influence uh, decision making, uh, what systems, structures and processes uh, might we look to create for them or, or, or facilitate? Well, this is the hardest part of it. I, I, you know, I don't want to give the impression mm -hmm. that this is an easy mm -hmm. problem. I mean, you're absolutely mm -hmm. right. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, it, it's, it, you, you can't tell people who are disadvantaged, mm -hmm. uh, marginalized and excluded mm -hmm. that wait for another decade, mm -hmm. wait for another generation, wait for two more generations. You know, Ralph Bunch mm -hmm. once uh, uh, made a very telling statement. He said that uh, equality is not something that we would like to enjoy posthumously. Mm -hmm. So that is true. I, I, I understand mm -hmm. that, that that is true. Mm -hmm. But I don't think at the same time that it is very useful to make false promises to people mm -hmm. and, and to suggest that all of this can be wiped out. And I think that we can do very much more. And I would say that, uh, that, uh, that uh, some initiatives have uh, taken place in the spread of elementary education, elementary health care. I mean, that is the route through which uh, the, uh, the, the other facilities that are available Mm -hmm. can be accessed without doing damage to the system as a whole. Mm -hmm. You have also written about how uh, uh, inequalities that stemmed from the caste system were really not all-encompassing historically, as yes. is widely believed, yes. uh, and have uh, continued and have manifest themselves in, 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 in different forms of uh, inequality. Yes. Um, how have you seen that yes. uh, unfold? Yes, I, th I think that is that is very that's very important. You know, I think that one can view caste in 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 more ways than one. I think one can view caste in terms of a certain social morphology. You know, the different groups, the different jatis, ranked high, low, and medium, and so on. And and one one is a jat or a, or a kurmi or a chamar or a brahmin or a caste. But one can also see caste as a kind of mindset which tends to. Uh, align everything hierarchically. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, ca in the second sense, caste mm -hmm. has been very powerful indeed. Mm -hmm. But even in the past, there were other sources of inequality arising from the ownership, control, and use of land, for instance. And it isn't, it isn't necessarily true that all members of ritually superior castes were wealthy landowners, mm -hmm. or all members of castes at the middle level of the ritual hierarchy were landless sharecroppers. That, mm -hmm. So there were mm -hmm. other forms of inequality, particularly inequalities arising mm -hmm. uh, from the ownership, control, and use of land, inequalities mm -hmm. in the agrarian social structure. Mm -hmm. But today, of course, new kinds of inequality are emerging in, in, in the sector of society to which both of us belong. Mm -hmm. uh, a new occupational structure has emerged. Mm -hmm. And this occupational structure has its own inequalities. A new educational system has emerged, and the two are closely related to each other. And these inequalities, uh, I, I mean, I, I'm not suggesting that these inequalities in the forms in which they are present are all acceptable. But these inequalities, by their very nature, are such that we have to live with them. You cannot expect in a highly differentiated occupational structure that all occupations will give you the same income or the same esteem or the mm -hmm. same authority. Mm -hmm. But those inequalities, in my judgment, are quite different mm -hmm. from the inequalities of caste and gender. Mm -hmm. Because those inequalities, the inequalities of caste and gender, mm -hmm. are fixed at birth, mm -hmm. so to say. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing mm -hmm. that one can do about them. So if we move mm -hmm. from a system mm -hmm. in which the predominant inequalities were inequalities mm -hmm. of caste mm -hmm. to one mm -hmm. in which uh, inequalities based on occupation, income, education become more salient. Mm -hmm. We haven't left inequalities behind, mm -hmm. but we've left the more odious forms of inequality behind. And yet that is sort of, in a sense, overlaid by uh, the access to political power and, 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 and the expression and, 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 the, and the manifestation of it that uh, people otherwise unequal yes. um, would yes. have enjoyed or enjoy. Yes. Uh, and, and, and in what ways do you feel that creates a more uh, turbulent 
uh, society. It, it does create a turbulent society. It certainly creates a turbulent society because um, inequalities of occupation and education need not coincide mm -hmm. with inequalities in the distribution of power in a system in which the politics of mobilization is very important. Mm -hmm. And so this disparity can be quite explosive. Mm -hmm. uh, those who, uh, who capture the commanding heights of the mm -hmm. political system mm -hmm. may be deeply resentful mm -hmm. of those others mm -hmm. who achieve success through the educational and occupational system. The, 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 the art of governance mm -hmm. is to see that that resentment mm -hmm. does not destroy mm -hmm. the new educational and occupational system, which is of value in my judgment mm -hmm. for future generations, for the country as a whole. Mm -hmm. And there is that, that particular kind of threat. Uh, but uh, coming back again to, to the new inequalities mm -hmm. that are emerging, mm -hmm. you know, from the sociological point of view, mm -hmm. we have to take into account not just the existence of inequalities mm -hmm. in the occupational and educational systems, mm -hmm. but also the reproduction of inequality. I mean, it's, it's one thing to say that there will be people at the top, people at the middle, mm -hmm. and people at the bottom, and you must accept mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. But it's quite another thing to find mm -hmm. that the same faces mm -hmm. are there at the top and at the middle and at the bottom from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. There is a great deal of reproduction of inequality in our country. But mm -hmm. I must say that there is also a certain amount of mobility now in mm -hmm. this society. We don't know enough. This is unfortunate mm -hmm. that our sociologists have not told us enough mm -hmm. about the new middle class that is emerging mm -hmm. in our metropolitan centers and the possibilities mm -hmm. of uh, mobility mm -hmm. in that middle class. And I suspect that there are certain sectors of Indian society today, particularly in the metropolitan cities like Bombay, Delhi, mm -hmm. maybe Calcutta, mm -hmm in which rates of mobility among the middle classes mm -hmm. are just as high as in Western societies. Professor Battle, thank you very much. That's thank been you. a great pleasure indeed.